breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You lay down your life And I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I see for All that you've done for me All that you've done for me and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun.
heaven's throne He came to us And set your heart upon the cross You'll never know the sacrifice you made For all our sin and all our shame You took the nails and took our place No one knows could do what you have done One name is higher One name is stronger Than any grave Than any throne Christ exalted over all From the grave Where death would die your name we recognize that if we put our hope in anything else we're always going to be disappointed and let down and wonder why the world is broken And God you are the only answer for the hurt in our world you're the only answer to have true peace and true forgiveness and true reconciliation and 
God, we want to be used by you to help spread that message, that gospel of Jesus Christ, that through him we can be made new people, that there's forgiveness of our sin, that you give us new hearts. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, LifePoint. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, you're just jumping in. Um, we're in a 10-part series um, based on two verses in Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And this is message number eight. So if you're just jumping in, you've come a little late, but uh, hang in here with us. I think that uh, you'll find something valuable for you today. Let's uh, just pause and pray together for just a moment uh, as we begin. Father God, thank you for uh, this moment. Thank you for this uh, time that we have together. Thank you for the gift of your word that you've spoken clearly into our lives and into this world. Uh, Lord, our hearts are heavy this week for uh, circumstances that have uh, come into being in the past couple of weeks, and uh, our hearts are heavy for our nation. Our hearts are heavy for the family of George Floyd, and uh, our hearts are heavy for cities in which there's been great destruction. And uh, Lord, we we just pray that uh, you would visit us uh, in a powerful way uh, as a church, uh, and as a state and as a nation that that god you would you would bring healing and that you would bring unity and that uh, jesus christ would be seen a uh, high and lifted up and that there would be a great spiritual hunger uh in, that would follow these events and this this moment in our nation and we ask that in the name of jesus and we pray lord now that you would Speak to us by your word that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that uh, we would see what you want us to see, that we would hear what you want us to hear, and then, Lord, that we would act in wisdom in response, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, those two verses in Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia are in chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And along the way in this series, we've pointed out that, that though Paul lists nine characteristics or virtues, he nevertheless writes of the fruit of the Spirit in the singular and not the plural. It's one fruit containing nine segments uh, not nine separate fruits. And I compared it in, in one of these messages with an orange, uh, one well-rounded fruit containing multiple segments. It's one fruit because it's the fruit produced progressively and relentlessly by the one Holy Spirit of God, who, when we trust in Christ, takes up residence in the lives of believers in Jesus and transforms us from the inside out. The verse begins with the word, but. And so we have to ask, but what? What precedes these verses in Paul's letter? And the answer is what Paul refers to as the deeds of the flesh. That is what what all of us as human beings are like, um, as we really are, all by ourselves, apart from the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says in verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It's also important for us to understand that the fruit of the Spirit paints for us a portrait by contrast of the character 
of Jesus Christ, who is himself, Paul told us, the exact representation of the nature and character of God the Father. John wrote regarding Jesus in the opening of his gospel that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Like Father, like Son. On the night when Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he had dinner with his disciples. And in the course of a long conversation in which he taught his disciples, instructed them, and and really prepared them for what was coming, one disciple named Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? To know Jesus is to know God the Father. And understanding the fruit of the Spirit provides some important tools for us for a deeper understanding of who God really is and what he's about in this world. So we've come this morning to the eighth segment, the eighth virtue, which is gentleness. Gentleness. What is gentleness? I think it's true that of all of the biblical virtues, gentleness might be the one that's most neglected, least prayed for, least cultivated in our lives, and that's probably because gentleness usually strikes us as spinelessness or weakness. Modern Americans and ancient Greeks have this in common. The Greeks viewed gentleness on the same level as weakness and cowardice. So what's this word all about? The word gentleness in the Greek language of the New Testament is praoutes. It's an interesting word. The root of the prefix pra emphasizes that gentleness has a divine origin. And that reminds us that when genuine gentleness emerges in our lives, it's one of the telltale signs that the Spirit of God is actually at work within us. The word proutes expresses strength and power, balanced and constrained by reserve and tenderness. That's probably why the Greek philosopher Aristotle, a bit more thoughtful person than the average, we might agree, defined anger as a happy medium between anger and angerlessness, a balance we see most clearly in the character and the conduct of Jesus Christ. So it's important that when we think gentleness, we also think Jesus. I'd like to share with you three Old Testament prophetic portraits of Messiah, two from the prophet Isaiah and one from the prophet Zechariah, that reveal and demonstrate the gentleness of the character of Christ. So if you have a Bible, please open it up or turn it on and find your way to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. I've got time. I can wait. You there yet? Here it is, Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. These two verses in this messianic Prophecy are are a study in stark contrasts centered on one person, the Lord God. Notice verse 10. The sense there is of God's sovereign might, his rule, and his sovereign freedom to reward and to punish as he pleases. God, the mighty warrior. And then comes verse 11, and, and suddenly we see God as the tender shepherd, tending his flock, gathering the lambs to himself. So it's just a picture of 
tenderness, carrying them, leading them with gentleness. You'll often hear the definition of gentleness as strength under control. And that's really a good definition as far as it goes. This passage offers us, I think, a slight variation on that. Gentleness is the balance of great strength and great tenderness. As another example, Numbers 12.3 tells us that Moses was the most gentle man who had ever lived, the most gentle man in the world. And yet he was simultaneously a strong leader and a fierce warrior. We might say that gentleness is strength constrained by the Holy Spirit and therefore exercised with the appropriate blend of force and sensitivity. I'd like to offer you a a visual illustration. I have here a, a red brick. It's just a just an old, well-worn brick I found out behind the barn here at LifePoint. It represents strength and firmness. It's hard, and it's heavy. But when I wrap it in velvet, it still retains its strength, its firmness, its weight. But now from the outside, we experience that strength in a different, less harsh manner. Gentleness as a characteristic of Jesus and as the fruit of the Spirit in our lives is like this velvet-covered brick. The second prophetic portrait is again in Isaiah. This time, two chapters Chapters to your right, Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. God is speaking through the prophet regarding the promised Messiah. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Now again, notice the contrast. Messiah Jesus would be the one, in verses 1 and 3, uniquely capable of bringing forth justice to the nations. And verse 4, establishing justice in the earth, and and don't miss this fact, especially this week. Think justice. Think Jesus. And yet in between, we're made to understand that neither ostentatiousness nor pretentiousness will mark his character. He will neither break the bruised reed, the one hurt and damaged by life in this sinful world, nor will he quench the faintly burning wick which I take to be the one whose struggling faith is just hanging by a thread. Jesus is the velvet-covered brick. The third portrait is in the book of the prophet Zechariah, the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Go to chapter 9 and verse 9 of Zechariah. And there the prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, speaking to Israel. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This prophecy, of course, was fulfilled in what we now refer to as the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem just a week before he was crucified. And on this occasion, the people shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Sometimes we think Hosanna means something similar to hallelujah or praise God. But what it really means is, save us. In fact, it means save us now. 
They recognized Jesus by the Messianic title, Son of David, and, and they were most probably anticipating that he was coming as a military hero. He would throw off the boot of Rome. And yet, notice with me that Jesus, on that occasion, didn't come riding on a white war horse, on a stallion, as a conquering king. He will one day. But on this day, he came on a donkey with humility as the righteous one who in a matter of days would bring forth salvation for the whole world, an expression of peace. Jesus, Jesus is the velvet-covered brick. Now observe the gentleness of Jesus as he firmly faced down those screaming scribes and frenzied Pharisees whose intent was to publicly humiliate and stone to death a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and then see his gentleness as he expressed mercy and grace to her after they, one by one, had gone away. Observe the gentleness of Jesus as he overturned the temples of the money changers in the temple who were crowding out the only access provided by Gentiles to draw near to the presence of God. You might say, gentleness? Really? Seemed kind of ragey to me. But yes, gentleness, really. Strength constrained by the Holy Spirit and expressed to accomplish a redemptive purpose. Gentiles who wanted to draw close to God were being excluded from the court of the Gentiles. They were being crowded out by the Jews. And the problem that day was, at its root, an ever-present one. Racism. Religious arrogance. The greatest demonstration of gentleness in all of history, of course, is the Son of God, nailed to a Roman cross, willingly, intentionally, purposefully, unhesitatingly. Gentleness is Jesus dying on that cross in our place, bearing our guilt, dying our death and praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We can see gentleness in the radical transformation worked by the Holy Spirit in the life of the second most prominent character in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. And in the first chapter of his first letter to Timothy, Paul wrote this about himself. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Recall who and what Paul was before that day on the road to Damascus when he encountered the resurrected, glorified Jesus. Here he says that he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. He had, he had been a Pharisee. He was authorized to persecute and even destroy the fledgling Christian church. He broke into the homes of Christ followers, both men and women, dragged them off to prison, and, and when they were put to death, Paul said, I cast my vote against them. He was a religious terrorist. And then he met Jesus, put his faith in Jesus, received mercy and abundant grace, and his life was radically transformed. And check out what he wrote to the church in Corinth. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, and he was planning to visit them. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out 
not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a a rod (laughs) or with love in a spirit of gentleness? I don't think when Paul asked, shall I come to you with a rod, he was talking about a fishing rod. I think he was talking about the rod of discipline, the rod of strength and firmness. He could bring that rod because he had done it before. So he asks, shall I come with that rod of discipline or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Paul could bring both. Why? Because Paul had become a velvet-covered brick. Writing to the Christians in Thessalonica and reminding them of the way that he and his team had related to them when he last visited them, Paul wrote that we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. What a transformation the Holy Spirit works in the life of the even most extreme sinner. Paul said in in one place, I am the chief of sinners. I've done it all. Paul would say, think sin, think me. And yet, he was utterly transformed, changed in every way by the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. See, what's very apparent is that for each of us in the Christian life, gentleness is the new strength. To the Philippians, Paul wrote, let your your gentleness, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Gentleness needs to be front and center in all of our interactions with Unbelievers, if the world is going to grant any credibility at all to our witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why gentleness is a prominent expectation in the New Testament for the lives and ministries of those who aspire to spiritual leadership. Among the expectations of overseers or elders in the church, Paul included the characteristic of gentleness. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 3, Therefore an overseer or an elder must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And in his second letter to Timothy, Paul added this instruction, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. See, leaders in the church must also be velvet-covered bricks. There are people who exercise power in the church, and because of that, they've got to be men and women of strength, who not only restrain their strength for the sake of others on a human level, but whose strength is constrained also by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of leadership, for the purpose of instruction and correction and encouragement. Gentleness is to characterize all of our relationships in our marriages, in our families, in our friendships, in our relationships with neighbors and co-workers. Before I wrap this up, I want to spend a few minutes identifying what gentleness is not. There is such a thing as fake gentleness. First of all, for example, gentleness isn't checking out or disengaging from conflict. You can't claim to be a gentle person if in situations of relational conflict, your only mode is to withdraw. Neither can you disengage and call it gentleness. You know, whatever. Or, okay, boomer. 
And I'll tell you very honestly, this is a personal struggle for me. I, I don't like conflict. I'd rather avoid it. <laughs> honestly, I'd rather run away from it. And James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So in moments of conflict, you're listening, you're controlling your emotions, you're controlling your speech, You're not disengaging. Healthy relationships need to both receive the truth and express truth. Secondly, gentleness isn't condescension. And and maybe you've done this. I I know I've been guilty of this before. You, You engage a conflict peacefully, but with a slight air of condescension. Oh, you're just upset. You know, once you have time to think this through clearly, I I know you're going to change your mind. And that's just patronizing, isn't it? What you're really doing is is minimizing and invalidating their feelings while establishing your own superiority. And doing it with a smile on your face doesn't make it gentle. And third, gentleness isn't passive aggression. Now think about that expression that comes from the world of psychology, passive aggression. It's being aggressive, but doing it in a deceptive, seemingly passive manner. You may not be screaming or yelling. It's possible you're giving people the silent treatment, and and you may not be doing anything that could be called overtly aggressive. Instead, what you're doing is manipulating people and circumstances below the surface in a covert way to your own advantage. The most obvious example of this is the silent treatment. You're not screaming or yelling. You're just silent, manipulative. Gentleness isn't dishonesty either. It is so tempting to withhold truth when you know it's going to be hurtful. And there are times when dishonesty seems like the loving thing to do. A little white lie. But we're called as followers of Jesus to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. Gentleness will guide how we communicate the truth, not whether we do. I I read this the other day in an online article on gentleness written to Christian women. The beauty of gentleness is that it doesn't require us to hide our strength. It doesn't mean we have to be quiet all the time or fit ourselves into a cookie-cutter model of femininity. Can you say that? Femininity. What gentleness does challenge us to do by the power of the Spirit is to use our strengths well. A velvet-covered brick. See, genuine... Spirit-produced gentleness moves us to be velvet-covered bricks in every relationship. Every relationship. I mean, it's ironic, isn't it, that we're talking about gentleness? In the wake of the murder of George Floyd, the extremely violent riots that have ensued in cities across our nation, it's ironic to talk about velvet-covered bricks in a time when We've seen so-called leaders who have seemingly nothing to offer but velvet and others who have nothing to offer but brick and still others who have nothing to offer whatsoever. What I do know is that we all need to pause and reflect on what has happened and to seek God's wisdom as to what we're to think and how we're to respond. I, like some of you, grew up through the civil rights movement. And though that period in time was a time of struggle, I would say it was also a time of hope. 
And honestly, my heart has been broken by the events of the last couple of weeks. Both the heartless and vicious way that George Floyd's life was taken. Yet another reminder that racism is endemic to the human heart and can never be completely eradicated from our lives or from our nation. And by the terrible riots that have been so destructive to lives, to businesses, to property, and to families, to the fabric of entire communities. See, gentleness is what we expect from our law enforcement personnel. We expect them to be tough and tender, strong, but constrained by the commission to protect and serve. We expect a police officer, don't we, to be a velvet-covered brick. But gentleness was sorely lacking that day in Minneapolis as Officer Chauvin and the other responding officers restrained George Floyd and as his life was taken. And it has been sorely lacking in the riots that have followed. I personally want to commend and express my sympathies with those who have conducted peaceful protests over the last couple of weeks. But I cannot fail to acknowledge the satanic source of what has been happening in cities large and small all across our nation in the past week. Jesus said that the thief, referring to Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And that's exactly what we've been witnessing. I reached out to Joe Sloan this week, who, with his wife Sue, has been part of LifePoint Church from the very beginning, and he he is a trusted and respected friend. I wanted to hear what he had to say. I met with him in his Tacoma office this week. I just asked him to share his feelings, thoughts, reflections with all of us as an African-American Christian man about the events of the past week. It was, to me, it was a uh, it was a torture and murder by a police officer. He was rather casual in doing it, in doing so. Um, I think that um, those things happen; uh, they have historically happened um, by bad actors within police departments. Um, I hold police officers in very high regard, all law enforcement officers in, in very high very high regard. Um, but at, at, however, as in all um, professions, you have bad actors. Um, uh, some police departments may have people who are, who are Klansmen or neo-Nazis, but the vast majority of, of, of police officers I've found um, do their job very well. They have to make a split second life and death decisions and um, and they should be respected for it. Um, it's really unfortunate that the other officers who were with this officer did not have uh, the strength to um, tell this officer to stop doing what he was doing, which may make them uh, accomplices to the murder. Well, I, I think that that the that the church is a is, is an excellent um, mechanism, for lack of a better term, um, where various races uh, worship together, relationships grow. I mean, I've met a lot of people at Life Point Church. We now are now friends. I think it's important that um, more white people engage black people, and and, and vice versa. Um, because uh, people tend to 
um, make wrong assumptions about people who look different than themselves, be it the way they look their hair, their, their speech. Yes. Um, and again, I think the reason why uh, you don't have people engaging the way they uh, they used to. We don't have neighborhoods like we used to. I think, and I think that uh, the the downside of your suburban neighborhoods is that your home becomes becomes the fortress. Yeah. Uh, and again, um, the church is a is a very good mechanism for fixing that problem. Make the church again the center of the of of the community. And and be and invite more and more people, especially people who look different than than yourself. Everyone's a racist, one way or the other. I mean, we all make assumptions about people because of of of, of their appearance, mm -hmm. um, uh, and even even assumptions that a particular race has a better, has more talented than, in, in areas than another. Um, though it is something that, that uh, though this racism may be viewing a, a certain race favorably because you are assuming that they're more talented in an area, for example, uh, Asians and mathematics, it is still racism. Because you're making an assumption based upon a race, not be, not because of your personal knowledge of, of a of, of a person. Right. Um, uh, my my wife is showing me uh, this. Uh, it was a I think, I think I think it was on YouTube. This fellow who um, this black gentleman has a beard and long braids, and uh, his argument was, "Don't call the police. Get to know me." Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was, and he was talking about what he does, the things he enjoys, and, yeah. and, and which would, which, which would surprise people based upon his his appearance. So it's important that uh, we as Christians um, engage people who appear to be different than ourselves, or even behave differently than than ourselves. Get to know them. Get to know why they behave the way they do. Get to know their culture and not make assumptions about them that could result in calling the police and having a person arrested or... In your mind, broaden your perception of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. View it as a multiracial multicultural church. Um, visualize that. E evangelize on, on that basis. Make, make friends who are, who are um, Christians who are not the same race, race as, as, as yourself. Um, see, visit black churches. You know? See what it's like. See how different races worship. And pray. Pray for our, for our nation. And avoid politics. Hmm. Do not think of yourself as a Democrat or a Republican. Think of yourself as a Christian, a child of God. Well, thanks, Joe, for sharing those important thoughts. And thank you, Church, for taking the time to listen. I want to encourage all of us to spend some time in deep reflection this week. To ask ourselves what gentleness requires in these days that we would live lives that are pleasing to God, that the Holy Spirit would be seen in us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. 
And thank you for this powerful virtue of gentleness. Strength constrained by tenderness and directed for redemptive purposes. And God, may we be redemptive in all of our relationships. May we represent you well. May the character of Christ be fully formed in each of us. And Lord, give us wisdom in the ways that we respond to the events of these days. Let us reach out to those who have darker skin than ours. Let us check in on them and find out how they're doing and remind them that they are loved and they are valued and they're respected. Thank you that your grace reaches each of us regardless of the color of our skin. And may we draw on your grace for the challenges of these days. And we pray it in the name of Jesus, the velvet-covered brick. Amen. Thanks, LifePoint. Have a thoughtful, great week.